We've been going through the book of James, and today we're talking about man proposes and God disposes, looking at James uh, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And uh, last week we talked about how we are to uh, submit ourselves to God and not play the judge and judge other people, instead to let ourselves be led by the Spirit rather than trying to play God ourselves. And uh, today we're going to continue a theme where uh, the idea of letting God be God instead of us trying to play God continues. So look at James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17 with me. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Well, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, and all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. We've been looking at uh, this idea of loving the world, and not loving the world, and we saw where John wrote, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so we're continuing based upon that original theme that we started at the beginning of chapter 4 in the book of James about worldliness and how that affects our Christian walk sometimes. And John in that verse seems to indicate that worldliness is an attitude of mind and a focus on things, and a lot of people are affected by that. A focus on the world, we have said, damages our love relationship with God. So the more we concentrate on the world, the less we concentrate on our walk with God, and we become worldly. We let worldly values and ways guide our thinking rather than God's ways guide our thinking. So what gets our attention, basically, is what gets us. And so we need to be careful where we focus our attention. And uh, in this passage we're looking at this morning, James reminds us that we're either self-dependent or God-dependent. We're either going to focus on God or focus on ourselves. We're either going to leave God out of the picture or let him have first place in our lives and direct us. Because ultimately, and this is what we're looking at this morning, Our lives are ultimately in the hands of God. Amen? Ultimately, uh, he's the sovereign Lord, and we're in his hands. And we need to depend upon him. Uh, The the old uh, mystic preacher Thomas Akempis coined the expression, Man proposes, God disposes. That's the title of our sermon this morning, but uh, Thomas Akempis is the one that is pretty much said to have coined that phrase. Well, Solomon said it another way in the Proverbs. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You you see, we think we're in charge, we think we're in control, we make all of our plans, but ultimately, God is the one that's in control. God is the one that directs our paths, and he has purposes and ways and and, uh, goals beyond our imagination and beyond our understanding. And he weaves all those things into his master plan. So the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So that brings us back to this uh, title, Man Proposes, God Disposes. And and so let's talk about man proposes. Man proposes, in, in other words, we can make our plans. We begin to plan and we begin to uh, look for ways to live our lives and we begin to uh, try to make decisions about where we're heading and so on. But um, we we need to understand that ultimately that when we make our propositions, when we make our goals, um, we're really not the one that has the final say in all of that. We make our plans, but God is the one who directs us and guides us. Now let's look at the context as we go into this passage this morning. 
Um, we, we've already seen in chapter 4 that James is writing to Christians. He, he says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Who's, who's he talking about, brothers and sisters? Talking about Christians, isn't he? And, and so the context doesn't change. He's talking to you and me. He's talking to Christian brothers and sisters. And uh, he's, he's uh, making these comments based upon the way some Christians were living their lives in his day. And remember the context of it. James lived in the Roman Empire, and uh, the Roman Empire was scattered all across the Mediterranean area, on up into Europe, on down into Asia and Africa. It covered a wide territory. And uh, there was a, a group called the Jewish Diaspora, the scattered Jews who had gone to all parts of the empire. And a lot of times the Romans would have them come to their colonies to help found the colonies because they knew wherever the Jewish people went, they would always bring trade and commerce. And, and uh, the, the city would thrive because of the Jewish presence. And, and so a lot of Jews traveled all over the Roman Empire setting up their businesses and, and operating uh, their uh, merchant uh, businesses. And um, some Christians who had come out of Judaism were involved in that business trade as well. And that's the context of what we're looking at here when, when uh, James writes this passage here in uh, verse 13. And what James is talking about is this. He's saying that, that self-confidence, self-dependence and overconfidence are foolish because they ignore God and leave him out of the planning. Because Christians were doing what uh, others were doing in the world, and they were making all their plans about what they were going to do, where they're going to settle, how they're going to sell, and so on and so forth. And, and James is giving them a warning. He's saying, look, if you're depending on yourself and you're getting overconfident, it's just foolish because you can't leave God out of the picture. And some of you are doing just that. You're leaving God out of your planning. That's why he says in verse 13, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. So you see what they're saying? Uh, we're we're going to go in the near future. We're going to go to that city. We're going to set up our business, going to set up our stand, practice our trade. We might stay there a year, might stay there a few weeks. We don't know. We're going to carry on our business, make a lot of money, and come back home. And you might say to yourself, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, basically, there's nothing wrong with doing business. That's how we make our living, isn't it? Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul uh, told uh, uh, some of the Thessalonians, you know, settle down and start working. Don't let idle hands be in charge of your life. Instead, get a business, get an activity, make money, support your family. So uh, certainly James and Paul weren't against uh, people making money and, and having a business. That wasn't the point. What, what uh, James is attacking here is not an attack on business, but he's rebuking those who leave God out of their business. They're making all their plans without even considering what God has in mind for their lives. And as a result of that, James says, you're just being worldly, just like those around you who operate their own businesses. You see, it's possible to be a good business person and operate businesses and make plans and, and, and establish principles for your business. It's possible to do that in a Christian manner where God is involved in what you're doing. Just think of the Gideons. Uh, you go to a hotel and you open the drawer. I, I checked it this week. I was in a hotel this week. Checked the drawer. Sure enough, there was a, uh, a Bible there placed by the Gideons. And that's their ministry. They place Bibles into people's hands, hotels, college campuses, all around. And that's their ministry. And, and in order to be a Gideon, you have to be a person that's associated with the business community. And they have a strict process by which you become a Gideon. Certain guidelines, beliefs and practices and, and financial stability and so on. The Gideons are business people, but they're also on mission for Christ. 
They have, they have a purpose behind what they do. They conduct their business and they thrive in their business, but they also understand that their business becomes a channel, a vehicle, a way in which they can become witnesses for the Lord Jesus. So businesses do not have to ignore God. And that's what James is saying. You're leaving God out of the picture, you business people, you merchants. And what are they leaving God out of? Notice uh, they're leaving God out of their travel plans. They're leaving God out of their business plans. They're leaving God out of their time considerations, their schedules. They're leaving God out of the whole idea of making a profit and how much they're going to make and, and what they're going to do with those profits. And I want you to know something. If you're not a business person, those things still apply to you, don't they? You, you need to decide when you're making pl travel plans, bring God into the picture. When, when you're making business plans, bring God into the picture. When you're setting up your time schedule, bring God into the picture. When you're considering how you're going to use your finances and money, bring God into the picture. You, you see, James applies this principle to all of us. It's not just business people he's attacking here. He's saying, look, don't be foolish. Don't leave God out of your planning. Bring him into your life. Bring him into your decision making. And yet, time after time, I'll have uh, families come to me, uh, parents come to me, Christians come to me, and they'll say, Pastor, we really blew it. We thought we had, we had this good deal. We were going to get involved in it. We bought this automobile, and we can't pay for it now. Or we're, we got into this lease, and we can't get out of it now. And, and the reason was they didn't bring God into the picture. They just thought it was a good deal, and they went ahead and did it. And now they're stuck. And so all of us need to consider, like James is saying here, we need to bring God into our lives in all of these different areas of our lives. So self-dependence and overconfidence, they're foolish because they don't bring God into the picture. You see, overconfidence is presumptuous. Overconfidence is presumptuous. What's that mean? It means that we presume on God. We presume on what's going to happen in the near future. Uh, that's why James says in 4.14 here, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Life, life is uncertain. The future is unknown. Amen? The future is unknown. We don't know what's, what's going to happen in the, the future. There's a real estate developer who is named Larry Silverstein, and uh, he, he owned a lot of property in New York City. And his own testimony is that he was obsessed with getting the Twin Towers as part of his uh, property and a part of his real estate uh, uh, empire. And so he was going to add the Twin Towers and the World Trade S Center to his holdings. And he ultimately did. He got them six weeks before the terrorists destroyed the World Trade Center and the Twin Towers. He had obtained a 99-year lease worth $3.2 billion for that majestic center. The future is unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. Look like a good deal to him. But sometimes our dreams turn into nightmares, and, and we just have to realize that life is uncertain. That's why we can't ignore God. We can't presume on God. We can have legitimate desires, sure, but, but James reminds us that, look, as we approach those desires, we need to bring God into the picture and get his guidance and direction in our lives. And, and life is uncertain, isn't it? Life is uncertain. We don't, we don't know for certain what's going to happen. The future is unknown, but life is, is uncertain. Um, the story is told of a 78-year-old man who had uh, gone to a physical examination for his doctor, and he, the doctor said, 
Well, sir, come back in six months. You look, you look great. And the patient shook his head and he said, Doctor, I, I don't think I'll be around then. And, and the doctor said, Well, that's nonsense. You'll, you'll be around for years to come. You're in good shape. And the elderly man um, gave him an odd look and then he, saying, he explained, I mean, I'll be in Florida. I go there every January. Okay. Life's uncertain, isn't it? We don't know where we're going or what we're going to do. We don't know what's going to happen to us. And uh, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what's going to happen six months from now? What's going to happen three months from now? We don't know. And so we need to realize our life is like a mist. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes. And so we need to be very careful in our planning and very careful in our understanding about what God has in mind for each and every one of us. That's why it's important that every day be lived for the Lord because you don't know what the future holds. And then James brings out this idea that self-dependence is marked by arrogance. It's marked by arrogance. In other words, I'm in control of my own life. I'm the one that's in charge. Who's God? We don't say that verbally, but, but we live our lives that way. We just pretty much do what we please and do what we want. And uh, God is an afterthought. But James says it this way. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. All such boasting is evil. And, and, and James is very clear about this, that, that uh, this boasting is uh, self-dependent. It's depending on yourself rather than on God. You see, pretentious boasting, what is that? It's just a refusal to do God's known will because you're saying, I know the best way, even better than God knows. And then boasting is evil because it leaves God out of the picture. It leaves God out of the picture. And the absence of God is a good definition of evil, isn't it? There was a story of a man and his family. They were on vacation. They were traveling um, in, in the mountains, and they came to a uh, large sign that was on their way to this remote camping area they were heading to, and the sign read, Road Closed, Do Not Enter. Well, the man went around the sign, and he kept on the road because uh, he was confident that they could get to the camping site uh, before the road got into any kind of problems. And his wife kept proclaiming, you know, you need to go back. You, you don't need to be going this way. There's a reason why they have the sign there. But he was a road warrior, and he knew best, and he was going to get them there safely. And, of course, as he was going along, the road was great. Everything looked wonderful. And then he came to a place where the um, road was washed out and the bridge was gone, and he had to turn around and head back to the original point at which they had gone on the road and as they got there they saw on the back of that sign that had warned them it said welcome back stupid <laughs> that's what arrogance is it's just nothing but stupidity isn't it nothing but stupidity it leaves God out and the result is we get egg all over our face you see self-dependent overconfidence ignores God presumes on tomorrow and boasts about personal plans and achievements. And James says, it's just all wrong. A Christian shouldn't live their life this way. A Christian needs to bring God into the picture. So man proposes. We make our plans, but if you're leaving God out, you're going to get into trouble. You see, that's where the rest of the uh, title comes in. God disposes. God disposes. In other words, the Lord determines our steps. The Lord determines our steps. We might propose, but ultimately God's the one that disposes. And he's the one that determines our steps. So God dependence is wise because it puts God first in our preparations. It puts God first in our preparations. Um, James writes there in verse 15, instead you ought to say it is the Lord's will we will live and do this or that. Now, all of us have uh, 
heard people say, Lord willing, I'll be there. Um, you know, Lord willing, I'll be there. Uh, God willing and the creek don't rise, I'll be there. Um, these are our expressions we've hear, heard all the time, and this is where it comes from. This is where uh, James brings this into the scripture. Now, it was a common expression in his day, and it's a common expression in our day as well. But the idea behind it is, is, is accurate. We need to say, Lord, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, if you're willing. In other words, you're bringing God into the picture. You're allowing him to direct your paths and, and guide you. Now, I went uh, <clears throat> last Sunday night through Tuesday morning to a pastor's retreat down in Tampa. Had a good time and uh, met with uh, other pastors. And um, I had a part on the program and was, was talking about the daily office where, where we need to uh, come together as a group of people and, and um, pray together and our church we've been doing that for like five years now 7 a.m. Monday through Friday uh, 7 to 7 30 and uh, we have a, a faithful group that comes and we have more on some days and and uh, less on others but this group off and on has been doing that for five years now and, and basically what it is is saying we want to put God first we want to start our day with God in control now this isn't to say that you have to come here and have uh, that morning prayer time. It's just a discipline that some people choose to do before they go on to work and, and go about their daily activities. You might have your discipline at home. Have a cup of coffee and do your daily Bible readings. That's just as valid, just as important. But, but there's something that we, we pray every morning in this daily office. And, and it's a wonderful prayer. Because it, it brings in this idea, if God is willing, if the Lord wills, we'll live and we'll do this or that. And we call it the prayer for the day. Prayer for the day goes like this. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. That's one of the most brilliant prayers I've ever heard in my life. And we pray that every morning because it accurately reflects the way a Christian is supposed to live their lives. God protected us during the night. He gave us a new day to live. We're asking him to preserve us so we don't sin, so we don't become overcome by adversity. And then we ask him to let us line up our purposes with his purposes, all through Jesus our Lord. That's our morning prayer, a prayer for the day. You see, that's why uh, James says we need to just say, if the Lord wills, line your purposes up with God's purposes. Allow him to be in charge of your life. You see, wise people are aware of life's uncertainty. Repeating a verse we've already read. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's an uncertainty in life. We don't know. But wise people are aware of that uncertainty. They're aware that these things exist. They're, they understand that, that these uh, different things will happen in our lives that we're not expecting. And so we don't need to be surprised by them. And uh, <clears throat> there was a pastor in West Virginia, and he was learning how to minister to Appalachian people. Now, Appalachian people are my people. I grew up in that area. I grew up in southeast Ohio, which is an extension of West Virginia and Kentucky. And um, Appalachian people have their own culture, their own ideas, their own belief system. Um, it, it's, it's just a whole different mentality in the way people operate. And a lot of it's because they're, they're coming from a coal mining community. And the coal miners, um, when they were working, they made good money. But they never knew from one day to the next if they would come out of the mine at the end of the day. And, and so there was an expression that the coal miners would use. And the expression was this. 
if nothing comes up. If nothing comes up. Well, I'll be there if nothing comes up. Yeah, I'm planning to go to that party if nothing comes up. Yeah, I'll be at that committee meeting if nothing comes up. Why they say it? Because life's uncertain. They didn't know if they're going to make it out of the mines or not. One pastor realizing that uh, this attitude existed was trying to get some church members to help him paint their old church because it was uh, uh, an old wooden church. It looked pretty shabby and, and he, it needed a fresh coat of paint. And so he would set up work days like we do and say, come on out on this work day and we're going to paint. Well, nobody showed up because something might come up. And so this frustrated him immensely, and he started thinking about it. How can I get people to help me paint this building? So he got the ladders out. He got the paint out every day, and uh, he would get on the ladder. He would start painting. And pretty soon there would be a couple guys be walking down the road, and they'd say, Hey, Pastor, what you doing? Well, I'm, I'm painting the building. Oh, okay, yeah, it does need a painting, doesn't it? Pastor said, yeah, sure be nice if I had some help. Well, we've got a few minutes. We can help you. And so they would come over, and they would start painting too. And then they would go on after a little bit. And he did that every day, and people would walk by, and they'd say, hey, Pastor, how can I help? And they would help him, and eventually he got the building painted. But it wasn't because he set up work days, because in that mentality, in that Appalachian culture, Something might come up, and they couldn't commit to any times to paint. And so we have to understand, just like those people were aware of, that wise people were aware of life's uncertainty. Something might come up, and we need to be careful about how we make our choices and our decisions. <coughs> the good thing about it is this. When we put God first, our relationship with God reveals God's purposes and his plans. It reveals God's purposes and his plans. In other words, we can plan according to God's will and way as we listen to his Holy Spirit. We can trust him and listen to him. and He will guide and he will direct us. In other words, it's not, okay, God, we're going to make our plans and we're going to ask you to bless our plans. No, it's you're in relationship with God. You're listening to God. And as he begins to lead you, you go in the direction the Holy Spirit says you need to go. You say, Pastor, that's, <clears throat> that's pretty inefficient. That's really not uh, something that, that we can mark down as you know, a, a way to make decisions in this world. We have to have our five-point plan. We have to have our five-year plan. And, and on and on we go. Well, that's the way the world operates, yeah. But it pretty much leaves God out of the picture because we've got a master plan. Who needs God? But a Christian realizes it's okay to plan. The mind of man plans his way. But the Lord directs his steps. We need to realize we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit in all our planning. Whether it's a church, whether it's a family, whether it's an individual, you need to be listening to the Holy Spirit in the way in which he wants us to go. As Proverbs 19.21 says, the human mind may devise many plans, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. It's the purpose of the Lord that will be established. Now, we have this uh, thing at our church called Quick Cast. We can send out messages to everybody, and I know some of you are just tired of getting the Quick Cast messages. But hey, it's a great way to communicate in our church. The guy that founded that is named Tim Staley. He's a, he goes to church at High Springs, First Baptist Church. A couple years ago, Tim Staley came to the pastor's group and he said, I just feel the Lord saying that we need, to, we need to do something else like we did with the Franklin Graham Crusade here in Gainesville. It's time to bring in an evangelist. It's time to bring in a big name speaker. It's time to, to uh, let the community hear the gospel again in a big powerful way. And so he began to challenge us to to think about what we could do and begin to uh, pray about what we could do. In the meantime, um, uh, Bob, Brett, <coughs> Bob uh, Shetler over at uh, First Presbyterian Church 
had come to that church and had restarted um, the Veritas Forum, which is designed to reach college students on campus. And so he's had several speakers over the last few years. But he also went out to the uh, University of California in Berkeley, and there he saw Ravi Zacharias Ministries on campus holding these uh, uh, <clears throat> witnessing events and luncheons and sharing the good news. And they were having great success. And he said, why can't we do that at the University of Florida? And, and so he brought that back and started talking to the, the pastor's groups about that as well. So uh, here we have Tim, here we have Bob, and God is leading them in a similar direction, unbeknownst to each other. And so we, they called a big pastor's meeting and said, these are some ideas we have. Let's pray and see what we can do. And they brought in some speakers, and they brought in some representatives from Ravi Zacharias Ministries, and, and they began to pray, Lord, can we have this event that we're going to have in Gainesville? Well, it just so happened that the University of Florida, this is a couple months ago, they said their schedule was such that they had one day available in January in which they could have a Ravi Zacharias event. So now we had to decide, is Ravi Zacharias' calendar going to open up? It just so happens that Ravi Zacharias was ending a, an event over in, in Egypt, and he was going to be coming back to the United States, and he had that day open, the same day UF had open. And so suddenly everybody's going, this is a God thing. God's putting all this together. And, and so plans were made. And in two months, normally it takes two years to put an event like this together. But in two months, God raised up $100,000. God opened all the details that were needed to be accomplished with UF and Rabbi Zacharias Ministries. And, and Ravi Zacharias and Vince Vitale came and spoke this past Thursday night. Now, I, I might be wrong. I think we had, we had uh, 11 or 12 from our church that actually attended uh, the event. It might be more than that. But we had many more that watched the event live stream online. But, but the event transpired because these two men were in tune with the Holy Spirit, obeyed the Holy Spirit, shared their vision, and others got hold of the vision and became involved in it, and the event took place. Thursday night, there were between seven and 8,000 people at the O'Connell Center. Now you say, well, what's that compared to? Well, yesterday they had 10,000 for a basketball game at the O'Connell Center. So it's a pretty good crowd to come hear an evangelist from India, right? And, and so God brought all those people together the whole floor area was designed just for students to sit. And there were over a thousand students sitting on the floor of the arena. The gospel was presented. The message was delivered to seven to 8,000 people. But they also said that it was live streamed. And worldwide, over 90,000 people watched that event that took place. Some of you here watched it online as well. And so God just did something wonderful. You say, well, what were the results? Well, we'll never know completely all the results, but they had these decision cards, the response cards, and 589 response cards were turned in. What those were, we don't know exactly, but uh, they'll be following up at all those different responses that were given. Now, I say all that to say this. The mind of man devises their plans but it's the purpose of the Lord that's going to be established. You think God wanted that event to happen? Of course he did. And so he put a vision in the hearts of two men that began to make this thing happen. Not because of something they devised or conjured up, but because God's spirit led them to do that. And as a result of that, a countless number of lives were touched and, and the gospel was presented. You see, we need to bring God into our thinking, into our planning. And as we have a relationship with him, we begin to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. You see, God wants us to follow him daily and not just a master plan. 
That's what we're aiming for, to listen to the Lord and follow him. So here's the principle. And, and James closes it out with this. To know right and not to do it is sin. To know right and not to do it is sin. We, we need to do the right thing. And if you know what the right thing is and you don't do it, then that becomes sin to you. <clears throat> and, and what James is telling us is this. Our sins of omission are just as wrong as our sins of commission. So what we know to be right and we don't do it, that's sin. What we know is wrong and we go ahead and do it, that's sin. That's sins of commission. Sins of omission are sins we know to do, but we don't do it. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And James says, look, you know what you need to do in your relationship with the Lord. You need to follow him. Not just make your own plans and go off willy-nilly wherever you want to go. You need to bring God into the picture. You need to allow him to be in charge of your life. You, you know, in that morning prayer that we do, there's a confession time we start out with. Listen to the prayer because it has a confession of the sins of omission as well as the sins of commission. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and deed. Those are sins of commission. And in what we failed to do. Those are sins of omission. Have mercy on us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you and live a new life to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's important that we recognize it's just as much a sin to not do what God's told us to do as it is to do something wrong. Jesus told a parable of the sheep and the goats, and he illustrates this principle. And he says this, he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These are the ones that are judged at the end. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. And you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And Jesus was basically saying this. These were sins of omission. Things you should have known you had to do, but you didn't do them. And as a result of that, they were judged, and they spent eternity outside of the Lord. You see, our lives are ultimately in the hands of God. And so we should line up our heart and our plans with God's purposes and God's plans. That's what James is talking to us about. It's not that business is wrong. Business is fine. But if you don't bring God into it, then you're, you're missing the best for your life. Same thing for each one of us, whether we own a business or not. If we don't bring God into our planning, we're missing the best for our lives. We need to consult him and have a relationship with him. So when we do make these decisions, they line up with his purposes instead of our own selfish purposes and ways. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, our prayer is, that will listen to you, that before we plan, before we decide, we'll spend time in prayer and we'll seek your will and seek your guidance. And Lord, it's not just a once in a while thing, but we're praying for the grace to have a relationship with you each and every day. So when your spirit speaks, we know exactly what you're telling us to do and we're ready to go. Lord, if there's one here today who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. May this be the day they say yes to him and, and develop a relationship with you. If there's Christians here today, Father, that have been walking their way instead of your way, may this be a time of repentance and turning and getting back in line with your life, your will, your purposes for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna stand together and sing our hymn of invitation. You come as we sing.